So what? It's another episode of AUA. I might have started a little too early, so we're now online, I'm sure. <laughs> so let me try it again. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thank you for um, coming to another episode of uh, Ask Us Anything, AUA. And again, it's Josh and Denny. Good hey, Denny, what's going Josh. on? Good morning, I guess, huh? Well, yeah, it just turned uh, noon around here, so I guess it is technically afternoon. How's it going? Good, good. good. So, cool. um, so today um, we keep switch, uh, switching formats slightly, but it doesn't matter. But we are switching uh, locations, so I'm not at my usual location. I'm actually down in Los Angeles. I uh, might have to do it from the Los Angeles. I go down here um, to, uh, with my parents uh, for them to Chinese medical doctor. So it might just worked out. <laughs> Very cool. So yes, you want to um, introduce a show and just get on with it? Because I know you have a deadline yeah. that you have to do. Yeah, yeah. So, so you know, um, last show, uh, Denny and I, we, um, you know, I kind of, uh, we, we did something a little bit different. I said, well, Denny, you pick, well, first it was three topics, but then we narrowed it to one each. I said, Denny, pick a topic that we've never talked about on the show before, and I'll pick something that we've either never talked or rarely talked about, and it'll be something fresh because Denny and I, sometimes we rehash the th same things, and it was, it was good, so, you know, um, but this time I wanted to push it even a little further, and I said, well, let's, talk, let's choose a well-known Dharma topic, but let's uh, give our own unique spin on it or mention something that most people don't really look at it in that way, you know, and with the catch of, well, we're not going to tell each other what we're going to talk about. So that way I was thinking maybe we can get a more spontaneous nature to the conversation. But, you know, the, the old uh, diehard professor in Denny, um, you know, uh, he told me right away what it was. He got pretty enthusiastic about it. And I was like, Denny, you're not supposed to tell me. But I'm like, well, this is so good what Denny's topic is today because... Um, and it, it, it does warrant the presentation he put together. And he, he puts so much work and time and effort into this. Um, so again, I'm probably gonna most likely just um, back out of the way here and we'll just kind of feel out um, the times when between the transitions and the slides or whenever Denny feels it's good for me to chime in because I, I don't really want to interrupt the flow if I, you know, um, and I, I might, you might yeah. see me taking little notes or something, so I don't interrupt the flow. So when I have time to comment, I can. So, yeah. So, so sometimes it's hard to tra translate um, languages, and only because the culture is so different. So if you try to translate the word spontaneous, it would end up being chaotic. So the Chinese culture doesn't allow itself to be so spontaneous. <laughs> well, that's pretty <laughs> accurate not, too. Not, not, yeah. Not, not a lot of times it does become, own. yeah, it does uh, become chaotic, right? A lot of times. Oh, yeah. yeah. So I, I, uh, I do like to pre-plan and, and then, you know, and then try to make it spontaneous, uh, you know, as part of my planning. <laughs> yeah. Today's topic is, is something that I've been wanting to do for a long time, actually. And because, and, and I think the timing is just right. And the reason why I've been holding back um, has a lot to do with uh, students on our Saturday practice. So, you know, we launch, well, we, we always had Saturday practice, but we launch it on the uh, real um, uh, Insight Timer uh, platform. And it was really uh, overwhelming in terms of the response. Uh, I, I mean, uh, Josh and I were saying that, you know, now finally we're, we're preaching to the choir. We're actually in the community of people who are, uh, who have kind of um, uh, dedicate themselves to uh, spiritual practice of all form, yoga, meditation, you know, chanting, all that. And so we were very happy, but still um, it took us a couple of months, I think, for us to finally uh, have a group of students who are repeating students. And this is a, a very important thing for us because now that we have students that, that we can practice together, we can kind of slowly bring them along and always kind of put the carrot in front of them, saying, hey, you know, this is where we're going, this is where we're going. So, so, so it's time, I think it's important now to, for us to really talk about the practice as something that is beyond just, uh, you know, physical fitness and, and talk about it really in terms of what Josh and I uh, think of a practice, which is that of a spiritual practice. So that, that's on one side. And the other side is that um, 
this is after all a UA assets anything so it is um, based on some uh, uh, questions that come from the, the students so one of the questions that came from the student and then it was echoed by other students which is um, you know could we could we could we stop midway and then continue because um, depending on the time so for example in the morning is evening in in uh, in Asia and then the evening is, you know, uh, uh, morning in, eight, uh, in somewhere and so forth and so on. So a lot of students say, well, you know, I, I can only commit to the first hour, but I don't want to miss the second hour. Can I pick it up on the recording? And then another student says, well, you know, what if I, um, I don't have time for the whole thing and then I just, you know, pick the one that really uh, resonates with me and I'll practice that. And so the quick answer to that is yes, 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 yeah, yes, you know, definitely, uh, definitely. Um, you can you can you can practice in any sequence. You can practice it at you know any time so forth. But having said that, um, I, I still would like to kind of talk about the the rhymes and reasons for uh, what we do. You know what are we trying to achieve from the beginning to the end. And so um, and so the topic that I picked today and uh, and I thank uh, Josh for uh, uh, indulging me on this is is. Uh, is the idea of with some some understanding of form and formness because we use that all the time um, is is that is is form and then eventually formness or rupa to a rupa and I think it might if if I want to pick um, if I don't want to modify that topic it would be form to formless and beyond so but for now I think I think just stick with that topic and so. Um, I want to I want to just um, use that as a as a launch point for a for a rather in depth discussions of the entirety of our spiritual practice where we st how do we start and where we're trying to achieve but if we ever get there and so I, bef so to do that I want to I want to kind of review a little bit of what we have talked about in some previous presentation and I always like to go back I always like to go back to good old Einstein and I like this picture I like this picture a lot and rather than kind of talk about what Einstein has done uh, which is tremendous um, I, I just like to kind of take what he have contributed and try to put that in the context of a spiritual uh, study so one of the things that you notice in this picture is that Einstein held up, hold, hold up a, a apparatus and that's for the measurement of time. It's a it's a it's a it's a timer. But what is what is interesting about this um, is that um, you actually don't start with time. You actually start with space. And it's only because you have space. And so the beginning of the universe is all about space. It's all about um, uh, the the creation of space. And it's only when you have space that there's a use for there's a there's a use 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 for time, right? I mean, I can talk about how long it would take for me to travel all the way to St. Louis to meet up with Josh for coffee. But if he and I were in the same room, then we won't be talking about that. We won't be talking about how long it would take for me to get to where he is. So if if space does not exist in the universe, then there's no reason for time to exist universe you have to go somewhere right and we always said that you know if you're stuck in the traffic why worry about you know how to be on time you're stuck in the traffic so so the idea of, of something the universe starting with space the creation of space and then once space appear then the necessity for time becomes important time is a measure that you have a metric then you can measure and one of the most important things to measure is something called rising and fading away or fading. Meaning that now you can actually monitor something and says, oh, it came into existence. And then, and then it just kind of slowly rises in, 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 in some natural phenomenon. And then eventually it would, it would just die off. If you didn't have time, then, then there's no way to, to do that. Now, once you know how, how something rises and fading, then you can say, well, is there anything that won't rise and won't fail? That it will always be there. And then the idea of particle versus wave becomes uh, uh, meaningful. 
that particle is material, or material has a way of rising and failing, that it comes into existence. Like you take a bunch of atoms, and these are carbon atoms. They're no different. Um, they're the same carbon atom, whether they eventually form a diamond or that they just form coal, right? But in the time of the universe, they have to come together. These, these carbon atom has to come together, and that's called the rising. And eventually, they would dissipate, and that's called the failing. But that, that phenomenon is true for a particular class of existence that we call particle, whereas the wave is something that it won't do that. It's something that will not dissipate. That's, that's the difference. Now, when you say wave, well, obviously, we talk about electromagnetic propagation. That's what it means. And now uh, a question that would come up and says, well, that's not true because if, if the electromagnetic radiation comes from a star, as I move away from the star, won't it start to fade? And the answer to that is no, actually no. It doesn't fade. It fade in intensity because the total surface area has increased, but in terms of the amount of energy, it hasn't fade. Now, the reason that... that um, Einstein was interested in this is that he actually started out with a very different um, a purpose in life. He was trying to argue that there was no such thing as ether. Now back in the days we, when we talk about propagation, um, every propagation, every, every energy, uh, any sound wave and whatever it needs a medium, right? So sound has to travel in air, has to travel through a uh, railroad rail, but if you have vacuum, then sound won't propagate. So, so this kind of energy requires a medium. And Einstein basically says, well, it's different for electromagnetic radiation, electromagnetic uh, propagation. And so this idea that our planets, between the planets, there are these medium called ether. He says, no, that couldn't be the case. So he actually started out by proving that there cannot be any ether and if there's no ether, there's no propagation media, then the speed of light would have to be constant. And it's because the speed of light is constant, then that is the characteristic of wave, and everything else would be particle. That's how, he, how, he, how his logic works. Now, what's interesting about that is that you can't have everything in the universe being constant. So if you make the assumption, and this assumption could very well be wrong. This is the thing about science is that everything that we ever assume is wrong. It's just right at the time, right? That's why, you know, when Galileo came along, Newton has to correct him. And when, you know, Einstein came along, then he has to correct Newton. And when Stephen Hawkins came along, he has to correct Einstein. That's progress. Okay, don't, so don't assume that physics is something that, that is true and, and forever true. Uh, it's it's an assumption. It's, a, it's I actually call it a uh, superstition. Superstition. Su su superstition. You know, it's it's something that you believe in because you couldn't believe in anything else. But the point is that the end result of all that is that time cannot be absolute. In other words, um, it, the the time uh, where 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 Josh is sitting and the time that I'm sitting might actually be the same clock. Might actually be the same. But there's no reason for them. There's no reason, there's no law, governing law that says that time has to be absolute in all corners of universe. And that is the conclusion that Einstein come to that I think is most relevant in what we do. Now, so if time is not uh, uh, absolute, then every corner of the universe can have different time. And, and one of the arguments that, that Einstein made is that, well, that he says that makes absolute sense because if you are... Uh, with a beautiful girl, then your time must be different than if you were sitting on a hot cinder. I'll come to that in a minute. Um, but if, if I were to look at the universe in terms of what's called the time dilation, rel relativity of time, then I can classify in terms of regions where time is gradually comes to zero, comes to standstill. And, and that actually is what's called black hole. And so, so the black hole has the, what is called the singularity where time comes to a standstill and material no longer exists. There's no, there's no possibility of material, that there's only wave. And then there's another region called the, called the, called the event horizons where you're getting close into the black hole and, and, and now sl the, the time was slowed down, right? And so, so, and it turns out that 
the Buddhists have been doing that for 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 ages, and the Buddhists have. You, you were going to say, Josh, I, well, I should I have given you a sense of comment. No, it's okay. I might I might as well jump in now. Yeah. Yeah, it's, please. It's, yeah, I should I should do that every every time. Oh, it's okay. Stars, yeah. We're feeling it out. Yeah, that's the thing, though. You know, because sometimes they'll get into a transition where it messes up the transition too. So that's okay. That's okay. Uh, we'll figure it out. So the, the okay. double slit experiment, a few things. The double slit experiment. You know about that, right? Where the you, you probably know how, more how to explain it than me about the particle going to a wave and wave to a particle depending on the observer effect. And I thought, well, that's interesting to maybe factor in here. And like you're saying, yes, these are all theories. The, the, it's the theory of relativity, right? It can't really be mathematically proven or maybe I don't, you know, I, this is way beyond my pay grade. And also I've mentioned this question before too, and I was looking at Quora, you know, this uh, site on the internet that answers questions and whatnot, and there is a, a post on it, but I can't really um, <laughs> pretend to understand a lot of it. But what is the speed of time? So if we have a, um, you know, d does time have a speed too? A and I think the reason why that might be relevant is because, yeah, if somebody's traveling faster than another person, well then that affects uh, different times too, right? The classic thing, if you're traveling so fast, you know, you can cover all this ground and come back. Well, it's like only a small amount of time passed for the person going really fast, but the person that, that wasn't going as fast, then they might have aged a long time. We hear this theory too. Then you get into stuff like sci-fi, stuff like the grandfather paradox, but I don't think that's really relevant here, so. So again, to, so Denny about the double slit experiment, and then I, I don't really know if the speed of time, if that's even relevant either. But mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah, so 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 yeah, those those are interesting topics to explore. But let me let me try to keep it simple by just drawing the the the, the parallel between what Einstein says, which is that is just that time is not necessary. There, there's no reason for time to be absolute. That each corner of the universe can have its own time. And if you rank the universe in terms of just time, then you get to a point where uh, time will come to a standstill, and that's the at the singularity of the of the black hole, and that's the that's the place where it's just pure pure wave now. There's no particle, and what what Josh said is correct in that in that um, we talk about particle wave duality as well. That the, that the particle and the wave are interchangeable. Anyway, um, so. In the Buddhist teaching, um, actually, this didn't come from Buddha. He didn't invent it. This is actually um, the, what the this is actually the yoga the yogic tradition. This is actually something that um, that that Buddha himself had learned as you know when he was a yogi that they separate the universe in this way. And so uh, in this case, I used um, Einstein's language, and he says that well, if you're uh, you know sitting on top of a hot hot cinder cinder, then you know. As far as you're concerned, then you know time, you know just just it's 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 a very very long time. And then whereas if you go to, you know, and you actually, um, you know, be with his hot girls, then you know time would go very very fast. And so so the idea is that is that in, this universe has these extremes, has these extremes where you know time takes a long long time, and then it you know seems like it's very very fast. And so if if we were to um, put that um, now you know this is a solar system, and obviously we only uh, humans only reside on the third planet. Um, but in that in that scale of time, there is a region called the human realm. This is where uh, the human re reside. And then now, if I were to take the um, the black hole and it just turned upside down, then at the very tip of the singularity where there's no uh, particle whatsoever, it's just pure energy, then that's probably what, um, you know, what, what Buddha would, 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 um, would uh, 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 refer to as, as, uh, as, uh, as, uh, as liberation or as uh, enlightenment, uh, where you're completely uh, outside of your... Uh, uh, attachment to material. Now, somewhere in here, and again, I, I will mention this because it just happens to be a, a, a big part of our, our popular culture. I talk about this film called uh, uh, Interstellar, and that was done by um, uh, uh, Professor um, 
who's the, the professor, the Caltech professor who's in the middle, who's one of the three people that received the Nobel Prize um, about five years ago, they actually received it for a gravitational wave. And so I, su I suspect after his retirement is, and he was waiting, Professor Thon, who, who was waiting for for his uh, Nobel Prize. <laughs> you know, you can't get a Nobel Prize until someone proves your theory. So he had to be the one that, uh, he and a group of scientists had to go out there to prove the existence of the gravitational wave. So he was waiting for the result. So he, he got into filmmaking and he made this movie called The Interstellar where part of the, part of the, um, uh, the story was that the astronaut got stuck in this, uh, um, this uh, uh, planet called the planet Miller which is outside, uh, outside, even outside of the event, event horizon of the black hole. But the storyline was that they were supposed to be there just very quickly and come back, just explore to see if one of the, you know, if they have any, 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 any people there. And, and they were supposed to leave, and, and, uh, but because of some uh, mechanical accidents, they were stuck there for um, three hours. And so when they returned to the spaceship, the friend who were the same age as they were when they left uh, had age, and in, in, in fact had age 21 years, because every hour on planet uh, uh, Miller is equivalent to seven years in, in, in our uh, uh, region. Now, if you work out the math, that that translates to be about 150 years. And so that corresponds to this region. Any case, this is this is just for uh, putting the two things in 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 uh, in perspective here. Now, of course, um, when we talk about when we study this 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 chart in depth, we separate into three region. And last time uh, when Josh and I talked about practicing in the the desire realm, that's the lower part. Uh, that's the lower part where human is is right below what's called the heavenly realm. And then above that, you have the different um, different uh, uh, realm of uh, called the heaven. Uh, I'm sure it's not the same as the heavens uh, among the, the 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 Protestants or the Catholics. It's a, just a word used differently. Um, what, probably one of the most famous um, heavenly realm is the one that is right on top, and this is the story where Buddha had became uh, a Wiccan uh, sitting under the Bodhi tree and his spirit had rise uh, above you know the human realm reaching this 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 top realm and then he was encountered by uh, Mara uh, who is the guardian guardian uh, guardian uh, for this realm his job is to prevent any um, any any beings from escaping uh, the the desire realm um, now, of course, just for completeness, uh, below the human, then we have the hell, the hungry ghosts, the animals, and something called Azura. So, so this is, we, we mentioned this before, this is what we call a desire realm. Now, we talk a lot about jhana too, right before the show, uh, Josh and I talk about potentially inviting someone who is experimenting with jhana realm. And so, um, this is actually uh, above that is when we start to talk about the form realm, and above that is when we talk about the formless realm. And so, one of the things I want to do is explain what is form and what is formless, and is there beyond, right? So the idea from is that th this is actually called the seven level, the eight levels of samadhi. So there's the there's the four levels here that coincide with the fourth jhana, and then there's another four levels that go up be in the in the formless realm. Now, there's another way to look at, and, and of course, um, when we say samsara, samsara is the constant rebirth. So when you die, uh, your energy doesn't dissipate and it becomes the, 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 the uh, starting point of another entity. So when we talk about that, we don't just talk about samsara within the desire realm, that someone could actually be practicing and elevated himself into the upper uh, realm. So, uh, Josh, you want to say something? Yeah, it's um, a few things. You know, um, well, Denny said we have a guest maybe that's been experimenting with, and I think maybe that might be confused with, I, I might have got, we might have talked previously either on the show or off show about how I found it was interesting to have people that have actually 
ex, uh, experienced these realms and, uh, and, you know, and, and visited them in consciousness and explored. Because I remember, if I'm remembering right, Joseph Goldstein, which is a pretty uh, popular lay teacher, his teacher, uh, is it Merninderji? He said he would, uh, that he would have people uh, that he was training with or practicing with, he would give them assignments to go into these realms and report back what they've seen. So that's where I kind of heard of that. Now the potential guests we're talking about maybe having on, she, um, now I don't know if she's done something similar to that, but I know she's practiced the jhanas under a pretty famous teacher. So um, yeah, so I guess it's just dependent on what Denny and I ask her. Um, she might have done some experience, experimenting too. We'll, we, we can find that out. Uh, the other thing, a few things I wanted to say was, um, you know, you hear sometimes in, I guess it's Christian, the seven heavens. Um, so I wonder, and that's another question I talked to Denny about too, or asked, we chatted with, about is, I wonder if anybody's ever done a comparative study with cosmologies, kind of interlinking them or showing parallels. I know throughout all kinds of different ancient traditions, um, there are a lot of parallels, but under different names and whatnot. So you know, I think it would be fascinating to be, do, do a compre or as close to comprehensive as possible uh, study, uh, cross comparing uh, cosmologies between things. And then the last thing is, uh, isn't it 31 realms? So these can be um, subdivided into 30, because I know there's different hell realms too in the B Buddhist cosmology, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, one one other thing I want to add, and this is this is because when we when we talk to um, uh, students and teachers and so forth, people talk a lot about their experience that they thought that they are actually experiencing something beyond, and and so the question is that you know, so where was I, right? And so so I I thought this is interesting. This is interesting. So when we talk about the six senses. Um, the, the, the translations are interesting. So, for example, the Chinese, they use the word door. So when they talk about the six senses, the six senses being the eye, the nose, the tongue, the ear, the skin, and the mind, the mind being the thinking mind, because this is all the bodily uh, senses, then the Chinese actually introduced the word door. So there's a sense door, and, and with the idea that we're now supposed to be the doorman guarding our senses. But if you go back to the original language and you see how the the way it was written in Pali, it's it's uh, it's actually it's, it's set injura injura. So first of all, set is is six. So got that. Now, what exactly is injura? Injura is actually the name of a diva, the diva king, who is in this region, the Tiva Timisa. Well, now of course the the the, the is known as now, of course, mm -hmm. among the Chinese, that that uh, diva king is known by a more common name, which is called the J Emperor. The J Emperor, you know, in the Chinese folklore, is is someone who oversees, you know, all the all the beings, all the human beings, the animals, and and perhaps you know the the the, the angels and whatever. So now. If you look up the word Indra, then it basically Indra is the name, is the is the J Emperor. And Indra means that all of those who are consistent with Indra. Meaning that meaning that what we call six senses is by design limited to only to what J Emperor can 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 see. So there is no possibility of us experiencing anything beyond that using our earthy presence. So anytime you have anyone who tell you about how what they're experiencing, um, just have an open mind, have an open mind and, and keep reminding yourself that as is written in Pali, it says that you can only go up to this point with your your six senses. Okay, interesting. And so now, go ahead, go ahead, Josh. Oh, uh, and then, you know, I think the word, to, there's a word too in Pali, ayatna. And, you know, not only, and, and I don't know how that comes in here exactly, but the indriya, yeah, it's like the five faculties, right? That's another 
Uh, that's another um, term in, in, in practice that they use Indria in, and that's for a different time. But, you know, I just wanted to point out that, yes, the, there are five senses, and it's also known as the five doors, like Denny said, five sense or six sense doors, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. Some people always, you know, guard, guarding the sense gates. So sometimes they're known as the sense gates. Sometimes yeah. they're called gate the sense... Gate is probably more accurate. Yeah, gate is probably right. more accurate. Some people, the, uh, the uh, six sense spheres, some people call them, and some people call them the six sense bases. So there's all kinds of different terminology, and sometimes in certain contexts, different words are more helpful than others. And I think it's uh, interesting to say, Denny talks about people uh, describing their experiences. Of course, we know that what we try to put language to and depict in images is not the exact same thing as the actual experience. We're, yeah. we're trying to describe that experience, right? And when you yeah. get so up let me, to these let me, let me higher levels, what I, yeah. yes, yeah, yeah. Let me well, is that real quick? Just, yeah. That w okay, when, go ahead, when we Josh. sorry. One last thing: when, when we get into really, you know, the ultimate goal here, there is no, there is no way to you can't. There's no, you can't accurately describe it with words. So a lot of times you get things that just point at it, right? So the finger right. pointing at the moon, because there's no way you can possibly, language is totally inadequate, images are totally inadequate, but okay. Yeah, yeah. so uh, thank you, George. So so the thing that I want to qualify what I said, I might have over, overstated it, is that I don't mean that you couldn't experience beyond that. I just meant that you couldn't experience it with your body and your brain is part of your body. Now, that doesn't mean that you couldn't experience it with your mind, your pure mind, right? So, and, and, and just so that it's beyond my capability to even imagine that. And so, anyway, um, so again, using the same chart and just kind of um, just compare, and uh, we did, did, we're still in the review uh, right now, which is something that we talked about in the past, is that when you talk about Taoists, because a lot of our practice comes from the Taoists, and, and so um, one of the things that I always want to remind people is that until Bodhidharma uh, came along, Bodhidharma was a yogi who visited um, uh, uh, China uh, about 1,500 years ago, until he came along, all the Taoists were alchemists. And it's, and it's only after um, the Chinese learned meditation from Bodhidharma um, that they were able to refine the technique and they went from ex what's called the external dan to the internal dan. That, that it's not something they just swallow, but it's actually something that is developed you know, within them. Um, this actually is much more consistent with the original intent of uh, the, the Taoist teaching other than the, the alchemist part, because you remember we talked, uh, we had a talk about the difference between qigong and which is a very modern term versus the original term, which is called Tao Yin, right? So the word Tao in that case is is not the same as the Taoist. It's actually just uh, the the word for the Taoist. Interestingly, it's written in two parts. Is it, one part is the head, and then the other part is the boat. And together it represents a path. So it's, it's someone who's 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 on a on a boat, and that, that, so that would mean a path, a waterway. Whereas the Tao Yin is the same word, but with the with the, another word added to it called inch. So in that case, the Tao Yin is, is the guiding, it's the guidance. And then and then when you go to the Yin, is 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 actually the the same word for enticing. For, for, for something that if you want to, one of the very famous proverbs that we use, the way, where that word came up, is that you want to you entice the snake to come out from the cave. And so it's interesting to, to think about those two words to, to really understand that the original Chinese, other than the alchemist, but they were really focused on bringing something from within. It wasn't about, so when we talk about development of qi, qigong, it wasn't, qigong is not something that is external and now you want to practice and get more of. It's a complete opposite where it is already in you and now you just want to find a way to, to guide it and to entice it to come out, right? And so, so, so Taoists, um, they, their practice is about um, elevating from the human realm. 
Okay, so it's always about th this. This is this has been the focus. Is the focus uh, is all the meditation is. The, so in that case, you can think of the Taoist practice as a very subset of the yogic practice. But it's very easy. Uh, I mean, much more accessible. I mean, especially for us when we talk about qi and all that, it's much more accessible. And forget for a minute that you know it's only focused on the the desire realm. Now, where's the 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 yogic practice? Uh, is is actually beyond the um, uh, the, the desire realm and is now into uh, what's called the form and formless realm, and and this entire space is called Brahman, and which is the name of the one of the one of the one of the uh, one of the uh, diva king, and so the word yoga, yoga, means. Um, mind and body to be one, right? Now, but it's interesting that when you study that, when what they call mind is actually Brahm, Brahman. And so a purifying mind for them is the mind of a Brahman. And so they actually believe that the North Indians, the, the, the people who consider themselves the upper caste, they actually believe that they are descendants of Brahman, the Brahm, Brahman king. Okay, and then all they're trying to do is return to that. Yeah, go ahead. And this is why the cast is called the Brahmins, right? Yes, the Brahmin yes, the cast is called the Brahmin, yeah. yes. But, but in, so Buddhism, I, we, uh, in Buddhism, there's the Brahma Vihara, so it's kind of reframed. Instead of something outside yes. ourselves we're trying to get to, yes. we have these natural innate qualities that we can radiate, right? Yes, yes. So, so, the, so the Brahma Vihara is the, is the house of the Brahmin. Is the is the, uh, is the house of the Raman. So those are the four corners. So, so when you you know when you when you go to someone some rich people's house back in the old days, they would have different rooms where they would meet their guests separately, and each one has its own theme. You know, so if you have a scholar, they would invite you. It's like the White House, you know, where you have the Lincoln Room and all that. And so so the four rooms, the four uh, is of the Brahman, Each one has its own characteristics. And in the middle of a lot of these houses, or with Vedic architecture, is the Brahmastan. The Brahmastan. Mm. So it's the thing from the very yeah. center that ties the whole room together, right? Yeah, yeah. So the or, just, uh, just, yeah, just, the meeting place. Yeah, of so, everything. so when 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 Josh talked about the uh, the the Brahma Vihara, that's that's the that's the compassion, loving kindness, empathy, and equanimity. That represents the four corner of the Bra the house of Brahman. Um, now. So it's it's important to keep in mind that the historical Buddha was a yogi and has always been. And in fact, you know, in his in his seven years as a wandering um, uh, a yogi, he was able to. We talk about this in the past that he was able to find two very good teachers and taught him so that he actually reached the, the uppermost of the the, the 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 eight levels of samadhi. And yet he was not satisfied. He was not satisfied that even when you read the uh, Arupa uh, uh, realm, the, the formless realm, that you're still not completely liberated. And so eventually he came up with his teaching, which is a Buddhist teaching, that allow him to escape not only the desire realm and not only the form realm, but also the formless realm, and with that, he has completely removed it himself from what is called samsara, right? So that's the difference between the Buddhist teaching, the yogic teaching, and the Taoist teaching. Now, of course, we're sitting way down here, and we're looking up. And so anything I can get my hands on to, to elevate me, to get me a, 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 a better status, I would do it. And so that's why you would see that uh, our, going back to our practice now, you know, whether or not we can do this in piecemeal or or whether or not we can do that you know, in disjointed manner? And the answer is yes, because we're so far away from, like my master would tell me, it's okay, you're still very far from Nirvana. <laughs> so at this well, moment, it, it's okay, you know, just, just do, whatever, do whatever that helps you. Yeah. yeah, and Denny, you can't buy this at Costco either, right? And you can't find this at Costco. You no. can't get discount on. You can't get discount on volume. Okay, okay. So, so just so that's why that's why our practice have so many different elements to it because it's just it's a very pragmatic pragmatic way of of elevating ourselves. So part of it is the Taoist, you know, the twelve 
the 12 uh, uh, energy line is 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 very dowers. Uh the the energy point is dowers, but yet we do a little bit of, of yoga, a little bit of yoga in the traditional sense, right? And then ultimately there's a big part of us are that, that are rooted in the Buddhist teaching. Okay? And you know, one when, when I came across this um, this saying, you know, well I think it's a reading in the suttas where somebody asks, you know, like, well, what happens after uh, enlightenment is realized? Will I exist? Won't I exist? Will I both exist and not exist? Or will I neither exist nor not exist? And the answer was given was none of that even applies. None of that so applies it's some, because it's, it's beyond yeah. our comprehension, you know, because some yes. people will get, you know, scared that they, you know, life will go on forever and ever and ever. Some people are yeah. the opposite, you know, the other extreme of annihilation, like there'll be nothing. So those things don't, we can't really fathom or comprehend because those things don't even apply to the ultimate goal, well, right? Th th thank you for that, Josh, because mm -hmm. back to my first slide about uh, Einstein and his idea, you know, how he came to this idea of relative time, I said that the, the, the starting point is space. Existence is space. Existence is separation. So again, if there's no separation between Josh and I, that we are one of the same, then there's no existence. There's no distinction between our existence, right? So if there's no separation between Josh and I, and there's no separation between Josh and I and the rest of the universe, then we don't exist in that sense. That's right, but we, it's not non-existence either because that doesn't really apply either. You know, it, when space, we can't really fathom anything without space and time. Uh, you know, most of us can't. There's no way to really fathom or comprehend when, when that's taken yeah. out of the so, equation so entirely. Maybe the, maybe, the, maybe the next slide would, would help a bit, just a little bit. So, so the question now is, is what is form? What is rupa? Right? So because the title of the talk is Form and Formless. So, so, so rupa, like the rupa realm and the a rupa realm. So every time you see an a, is the opposite. Right? So, so, the rupa, so the definition of rupa is form, is material form. Okay? Now, I just want to list some examples of how that word is used, and this hopefully will come back to to what uh, Josh just talks about. So one of the one of the most common way of the usage of the word rupa is together with the word called Gaia, and Gaia we know because Gaia means body, and so when we talk about the four foundations of uh, mindfulness, the first foundation is the mindfulness of the body. But actually, body is Gaia. It's not just the body, but everything that is physical for us. So, so when we use the the word, the phrase Rupa Gaia, it has a it has a, a a very important original meaning, and it has to do with uh, Buddha. And so, when Buddha, um, you, so so I follow up the train of thought here. So, when Buddha became a Wiccan, he no longer exists. No longer exists in the sense that 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 he no longer has a boundary to his existence. That he's one of all uh, together, right? But in order for him to actually give benefits to the beings, he has to attain some kind of form. Okay, it's not different from now. I'll, 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 I'm sure I step on some toes with saying that. But what you know, think about the word incarnate. You know, Jesus was incarnate. I mean, this was in the Bible. So you know, Jesus was the Son of God, and in order for Him to help um, us, he, the, 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 he has to incarnate into His body. That's why He, you know, He had it had to be a virgin birth. Right, so so the idea of the way the word uh, Rupa Gaya uh, original use is, is when Buddha had a different body. What he had was called a Dharma uh, Gaya, which is a which is a a, a, a a different kind of existence. And but in order for him to actually show up in in a, in a face, he would have to um, uh, incarnate into a physical form. So the word Rupa Gaya is used that way. Okay. Now there's another way that rupa is used, which is in one of the five skandhas, and so the word kandra kandra is the same as skanda. Skanda is Sanskrit, and kandra is Pali. And so for those who have heard of the five skandhas, 
um, then Ruba represents the first one, which is which is everything. So 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 for example, um, earlier I talked about you know how your your six senses you know is is in Pali is called set injura, and you cannot experience um, anything beyond uh, the J Emperor. And I'm talking about Ruba. I'm talking about just the physical form that you cannot experience. And so beyond the beyond the physical form, then the rest are the mind mind form. The, the, the rest are come after the, the rupa, after the form, you have the sensation. Uh, we talk a little bit about that sensation, perception, uh, volition, and then consciousness. The other four has to do with mind, pure mind, not thinking mind. Whereas the first part, the rupa, in this case, is called rupa gendra or rupa skandha, skandha is the, the, the totality of everything that is physical. So it's not just about a body, the eye, the nose, the mouth, the ear, and the skin, and our thinking brain, but which is the physiology, but also the physics, the sound that comes through the, the hum to your ear, the sight that comes to your eye, the smell, the taste, and all that. So all of that together is, is called rupa. So f in that case, form represents everything that is physical around us. Now there's another way. Go ahead, Josh. Oh sure. The um, you know one other um, tr translation I've heard of rupa is materiality. So and then uh, nama rupa, which we'll get to uh, mentality, materiality. But we'll get back to that, or we'll get to that. Um, the that's, the yeah, other th that's very good. Mm -hmm. That's very good. Yeah. Uh, um, because it's yeah, it's it's a subtle distinction. But now Denny's just pronunciation here. Um, that with uh, uh, I thought it was interesting. It sounds more like to me like Gaia, which some people will actually call the name of the Earth, which I thought was real interesting. Now I've heard this pronounced with more with a K, um, Kaya, like Dharma okay. Kaya. I mean it's very similar okay. with the K, but so and then the other one. Um, um, Kaya skanda. is very correct. Yeah, Kaya is very. It correct. might be, and then uh, Skanda and uh, um, the the Kanda, the Skandas, the Kandas. So I I don't know for sure. There might be some um, distinctions, but just for the um, for the audio only people, the Kaya or is K A Y A with the um, with a mark above the A, um, and then uh, the Kandas or Skandas or um, it's K H A N D H A. Um, Denny's got, and then the th the thing with nibbana, though, you know, about taking a, a human form. So I guess if I'm getting this right in, in the Theravada tradition, there's a nibbana, but then there's para nibbana. So when the actual um, physical form passes away, right, then it's considered para nibbana. So I think that's how Theravada deals uh, with it. And it, yeah, and, and and so I guess in the Mahayana, it's considered a dharmakaya. So it's a it's a it's a different type of body. So yeah, I'm not too familiar with with the um, with the Mahayana uh, w way to do it, either, but yeah, so it's it's there's there's subtle distinctions, but they're they're both um, I, I I find them both helpful. So the the more yeah. information I have on this, the better for me. So yeah, yeah. So another way, and one last point, um, another way that the word uh, rupa appear is as as Josh had mentioned already, that is in the another terminology called nama rupa. And in this case, um, some people would just translate that into name and form, Nama's name and form. But actually, I, I like uh, Josh um, uh, bringing up the idea between materiality versus, what's the other, mentality. Mm -hmm. mentality. Mentality. Yeah. yeah, so this is very important. So, so, so this, this phrase, Nama Rupa, appear in the 12 links of interdependent origination, starting with ignorance, Going to uh, sankara, which is which is uh, mental volition. Going to consciousness, and then finally uh, to the nama rupa. And so, actually, nama rupa uh, in that case um, is really the the most encompassing term for mind, with the idea that within mind there is the pure mind, and then there's the thinking mind, and so. If you say, well, isn't a brain part of a mind? And my argument to that is yes, but it's the thinking part of the mind. It's the materialistic part, materiality part of the mind. Whereas when we talk about the mind as in the remaining of the four scanners, the perception, uh, the, 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 the sensation, perception, uh, volition, and consciousness, that would be the 
um, the spiritual spirituality or what what Josh said is the is the is the mentality part of the mind okay and just a quick point this is actually very important that when you try to understand the 12 links of in uh, independent uh, in, uh, the, uh, interdependence that everything starts with ignorance ignorance is actually a karma that's a seed from a karma. So, so when when someone goes out and murders someone, you know, doing mass murder or whatever, um, it's not because he started with external factors like I happen to look Chinese and he hated me. No, because the hate comes from within. That he had his karma is full of hate, and there was a seed. And the question is, when does that become real? When what not real as in uh, uh, real imaginary, but be, where he is become actionable. But the important thing is that is that it all starts with the ignorance seed, and from that the next step is called the the um, uh, uh, volition, where that seed becomes consciousness, becomes something that he he wants to exercise. Now then it goes to the next one, the next one of the chain, which is nama rupa. That's our mind. That is a mind that 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 it co it goes from. The, the the mentality mind and actually realize itself in the material materiality mind your brain that's when he goes out and he try to locate the people and the gun and so forth and so so I I, I like the the word nama rupa because it represents the combination of a mind both the physical mind and the uh, spirituality mind or what Josh called the material uh, material materialistic part and the spiritualistic part yeah go ahead Josh yeah and it's um you know this is reminding me I wanted to say at the beginning that this the, the understandings we're talking about here realize that you know um, any kind of kind of understanding we think you, you can get from these talks and whatnot that's pretty much kind of a hearsay um, because what we ultimately want to do, we want to see and know this for ourselves, right? And this can yes, be what yes. we're doing here, a great aid, but just you know, keep that in the back of the mind that this is all just things for you to check out for your own experience. It's not to be believed, it's to be put in the practice and try it and see if it, you know, to, to know and see for yourself. Um, and then, you know, the, the Buddha is one of the unique things he is said to offer was the, the, inter, uh, the um, codependent arising or interdependent um, dependent origination. There's there's a few other terms, uh, translations for it as well. Uh, one of the unique things about this is, uh, yeah, why it's what what we often think of it starting in ignorance and going in one direction all the time. Realize that we can wake up on uh, kind of any well, not any, but uh, various parts of the twelve links. And so when we when we actually have our experience where we we realize that oh this link is now in play well then that's kind of our starting point temporarily right we use ignorance because that's like when we teach it or when it's being taught that's the best starting point but it is a wheel right so it's not like a, a linear thing either it just keeps going around and around and around and then there's also the opposite of um, the the whole what is it what maybe Denny can help me out the um, the I don't even know what it's called, but the, the like the the wholesome part, like not the the, the cycle, but no, oh, I'm blanking on this. Um, but it's not talked about as much as it's kind of more like the liberating wheel instead of like the. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I don't know. I, maybe I'll make a note to see if I can find what I'm talking about. Okay. Um, okay. So, bad so bad so dimension. To, if I can't even yeah. remember it. <laughs> yeah. So back to the chart that I showed earlier uh, about the three realms. So. So the practice is really about moving from the, the desire realm to the form realm and then ultimately to the formless realm. But what's interesting is that Buddha wants to go beyond that. So the question then is that what is he trying to go beyond to? Right? And so now I'm going to bring up this other concept called, it's called Nimitta. And Nimitta, uh, it's not talk about as much in the Western uh, culture as it is in the, the Chinese culture. The Chinese culture is all about this word, uh, Nimitta. And so so I just want to say that Rupa is a little bit, uh, form is very different from Nimitta. And so I see translation of Nimitta as a sign, uh, a sign. Um, Let me jump in here real quick, Denny, with the pronunciation. Yeah. I've heard it pronounced Nimitta. Some people nimitta. pronounce it okay. nimitta. So e either way, yeah. just so we know what Thank we're talking you. about. Thank you. So nimitta, nimitta is translated as sign, but rather than trying to 
figured out whether that is the correct um, translation or not. Because the word nimitta is most commonly talked about in the in the Diamond Sutra, in the Diamond Sutra. And now one of the translation for the Diamond Sutra is that they actually translate that Chinese word, the the nimitta, into something called no. Lo, notion, the four notions. So what does that mean? So, so in the in the in the Diamond Sutra, then they talk about the notion of self, the notion of human, the notion of beings, and the notion of time, time a lifespan. Now, um, and and the idea is that uh, when when do you be, when do you have the notion of self? So again, this is identity, or this is um, uh, distinction, or what Josh talked about earlier, which is about existence. So think about this. So you wake up, you're lying in bed, you slept, you slept all night, and you wake up. What's the first thing you do? You know, you figure out if you exist or not. You figure out where, you know where 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 am I? Where do I where did I sleep? Sometimes you wake up, you don't know where where you were. You know, so 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 that is the notion of self. You're trying to find your own existence. Okay, so that's the notion of self. Now, if you were Buddha waking up, he probably doesn't even care where he wakes up, right? <laughs> now, the idea of notion of humans is that is that you know, like Josh and I are both humans, as opposed to you know. Are pets, which is not humans, right? And so the idea that humans belong a class to self, that's that's a very interesting notion. The idea is that besides humans, there are different beings. Some of them are things that we can embrace, like the pets, the animals, and some of them we might not want to embrace, like the hungry ghosts or whatever, right? And then finally, the idea that, that there is a limit or unlimited time span for existence. Now, what's interesting is that they all belong to this idea of time and space. And so, so when, talk, when Buddha talk about being enlightened, he's really talking about the, the, the opposite of nimitta, which is called a nimitta, or translated as sinus. Okay, now it, is, it gets very complicated, but the point is that when you are finally freeing yourself, not only of your de desire, not only of form, not only of your focus, because even then you haven't achieved enlightenment. You're still stuck in the three realm, you know, forever uh, uh, reaper. And what Buddha basically says is that in order to, ex once you escape that, you are beyond space and time. You are now at the singularity of the black hole. That's enlightenment. <laughs> now, and this maybe, is important. I want to. I want to just. That. I want. No, hang on. Hang on, Josh. I want to. The reason I mentioned that is not to cause any more confusion, but to say that 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 ultimately is a purpose of our, of our, of our spiritual practice. Sorry, Josh. Go ahead, please. No. Yeah, and it's it's really it's really important, and I'm glad you brought this out because I'm not familiar with this. The, the, the context I know Nimitta in is the practicing the jhanas. Um, so it's completely different from, I'm pretty sure it's spelled the same way. Maybe I'm mistaking something here, but no, there's no, supposedly... No, I think you're correct. I think you're yeah. correct. They are, they are, they are, it's just, it's a question of, you know, if the question is that are they the same train, the answer is yeah, they're the same train, they just have different stops. Oh, that might be it. Because in practice, and um, you know, jhana practice, some people talk about seeing this the sign or this this light, and it's supposed to be incorporated into uh, samatha practice when you're doing these these jhana practices to go through the jhanas. And, but you know, I'm not experienced or qualified enough to talk about this, other than to say now I know when we uh, some people who practice jhanas and absorption practices and some to practice, they have a very kind of like, um, you know, there there's particularities around nimittas or not nimittas or how to use the nimitta in practice, how not, you know. So there's all these different variations and whatnot. And you know, a side note here, I, I recently found it fascinating that uh, one of the uh, teachers that I know in real life. She is um, says she's been working for a while on all these different types of practices to do to get into jhana states and how many different versions there are. Again, if I'm remembering that correctly, um, maybe more information to come if it, when, when that's available to release publicly. But yeah, as far as this goes, Denny, this is uh, these the breaking down these notions, you know, of existence. It's a very helpful uh, self 
you know, you know, more specifically into delineating between humans and different types of beings. And then, of course, our lifespan, because, you know, some of these higher realms, they said to have so long of lifespans, right? I mean, compared to ours. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Or, or, or vice versa. You know, our lifespan is so much longer than... You know, some of the lower lower species. You know, like that's right. It's relative. Right? It depends on your right. your perspective and viewpoint, or what being you are and what being you're looking at. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so so now, um, I uh, you know it took an hour to kind of lay lay down the the background and to review. So now I want to get into the practice itself, and and the and, and the practice starts with understanding of rupa understanding of a material form. And so, there. remember I talked about the Rupa Skander as something that combines both the physiology with the physics. And so the question is, you know, how, how are the two related? And I, I like this chart. Uh, hang on just one second. This is a good one, but... Um, so let's do this one first. Sorry, I did it out of sequence. So, so we talk... So this is another way to classify the physics, classify the, the external. So, so... The, we we call this the four elements, the four elements, and then and then and then there's another way to classify it, which is the the the, the sight, the sound, the smell, the taste, and the touch, and its corresponding uh, sense door. So sight would be the eye, the sound would be the the ear, and the smell would be the nose, and the taste would be the tongue, and the touch is the skin, is the body. So this this particular way of explaining I like a lot, and it came from a uh, a monk in Hong Kong. Actually, it's actually one of my grand grandmaster. Uh, uh, so so it basically says that what is earth, you know. Rather than trying to argue, oh, earth means, you know, dirt. No, no, no. Earth is something very simple. Earth is something you can see, you can smell, you can taste, and you can touch. If you could do all four, that's earth element. Now, if it's something that you can see, you can taste, you can touch, but you cannot smell, that is called the water element. If it's something that you can see, and you can touch, but you cannot smell or taste. That is called the fire element. But if it's something that you cannot see, you cannot smell, you cannot taste, but you can touch, that's called the wind element. So wind element is not just airflow. It's actually uh, all your um, all your nerves, ner neuro sensation. If you feel anything, so if you feel pain, for example, then it's a combination of the wind and the earth element. Okay, now the reason I want to do that, and 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 uh, let me come back to this slide. This is actually a very important slide. There, over the years that I've been an attendant for Master Jiru, he has said things that it just is. It's just profound to me, and and it's something that I would just record in my brain, and then it just resurfaces itself every once in a while, and and I would keep going back to trying to gain more appreciation and more understanding. The first thing he said, which is only which he has only said in English for some reason, and a lot of times he said it in Chinese and he translated it in English, so this is something that he said only in English, and he says there is no mind. And I'm being a mechanical engineering professor. I said, well, that's what I used to say, that there is no gravity. And Master Jiro gone on and says, there is only the effect of mind, because there's only the effect of gravity. In other words, you're being a, 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 um, a being in the desire realm. You should not think that you can actually experience mind. You can only experience the effect of mind. That's one. The other one, he said in English, and he said that they it actually come from the the Agama Sutra. And many times when Master Jiu said that it come from the uh, Sutra, I can never find them. I can never find them. I don't know if he heard it directly from Buddha himself, maybe. <laughs> but I can't find them. So this is one thing that he said that I can't find. And he says, no, I'm, I'm, I'm very limited in what I, what I know, but I'm just kidding. 
So he says, if I translate it, and I, I have never seen this translated in English, and it basically says that if there is one Dhamma, okay, now I did I, did I spell it wrong? No, Dhamma. Now, notice I used lowercase d as opposed to capital D. So there's three definitions for Dhamma. One, one is mental activity, you know, so because when you talk about the eye, the nose, the ear, the tongue, the skin, and the mind, and then the corresponding physics is the sight, the smell, the taste, the sound, and the touch, the, the touch and the dharma. Okay, so so in that case, the little a dharma just means all the mental phenomena, all the stuff that goes on, all the electricity that goes on into your brain. There's another a definition of dharma, which is methodology. Okay. And then finally, the most important definition for Dharma with a capital D is the, the truth of the universe. So here, I, I just want to make sure that because it, it comes from the Chinese word fa, fa, right here. So I'm going to translate it directly into Dharma. So basically, it says if there is one method which can directly allow you to reach Nirvana, it would be the mindfulness of body. Now, of course, the word for mindfulness of body is gaya, gata, sate. Sate is mindfulness. Gaya is the body, the rupa gaya. Remember, so so this is so basically what master says is that if there is one method that will allow you to reach nirvana, that would be the mindfulness of body. Right? Now keep in mind that that when he used the word uh, nirvana is in the context of the Theravada study, which is that when you reach ara arahanship you already escape uh, samsara, then that's the first stage of nirvana, something that Josh had just mentioned earlier. But whereas the Mahayana, uh, the Chinese monks, they think that you have to reach Buddhahood in order to be called nirvana. Okay, so there's a little slight difference there. Now this is, this is a good, good piece of information here. So the point is that what we're doing is all about the mindfulness of body. And so what I'm about to explain is my understanding of Master's teaching on how we can go from A to Z. How we could start with breathing exercise and joint exercise and eventually become enlightened. Okay, Because here, what Master says is that if there's one method that would allow you to go from A to Z all the way to Nirvana, it would be the mindfulness of body, right? So I heard that, and I, I said, I got to figure this, figure this one out. So this is actually the pretext for this presentation, is I'm trying to report to you that I think I have figured it out, but I'm not 100% certain, <laughs> okay? So, well, so I'll start with this chart now. Okay, go ahead. Well, Denny, I can give you some uh, verification on that too, by the way. Go ahead, please. Slide. Well, real quickly, what was the first the thing for uh, Dharma? I have methodology in reality, but what was the first interpretation you had of it? Uh, mental phenomena. Uh, phenomena, okay. Um, yeah. Do you want to back so up just one quick? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, you know, um, the, the thing about there is no mind, I'll just start at that top. You know, that's right, because how can you actually prove it? We can't sense it. Using our other five senses, there's really no way to sense the mind. So we can't really prove that a mind really exists, right? Directly with our senses. So yes, but well, we can see the effects of it. Um, the, you know, the other thing with Dharma, uh, I think in a different tradition, it's, it's called, uh, they usually say, well, there's a Dharma that means the teachings of the Buddha. And then there's the Dharma that means, you know, reality, truth of the way things actually are. Um, and as far as uh, reaching Nibbana directly, from what I remember in the suttas, that uh, the, the, the Buddha said that um, the whole universe is within this fathom long body. And the fathom is, of course, an ancient or an older un unit of measurement, right? And um, I want to say I heard somebody say once that, you know, that um, maybe. Um, that after the Buddha died, somebody asked Ananda who would be our teacher now, and I thought one person said the interpretation was that, well, mindfulness of the body will be our teacher now. But now, don't hold me to that. I don't know if that's 100% no, correct. No, it's, or it's not. actually yeah. the yeah. The, this, this, that's a very famous saying: is that sila is a teacher, uh, I the see. discipline okay. is a teacher, and mm -hmm. mindfulness is our foundation. Ah, uh, so there was oh, there was uh, mm -hmm. yeah. 
So it, it, he actually asked. It, it was uh, it was uh, who was his attend attendant? What's his name? Um, uh, Ananda's attendant or the Buddha's attendant? Uh, Ananda, Ananda. 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 Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the story was that uh, when as 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 uh, as Buddha was dying, reaching Nirvana, ultimate but Nirvana. Uh, Ananda, who was his uh, attendant, it was also his uh, his cousin, I think. Um, yes. Cousin or, 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 or nephew, I forgot. And his he was crying. Yeah, he was crying. He was crying. So he's forty years old because because he was born on the day when when Buddha re um, uh, reached uh, um, uh, enlightenment, and um, so he's forty years old and he was crying like a baby, and so one of his elders says, "Why are you crying? Why don't you?" You know, make use of time and ask the Buddha some important questions. So he asked him four questions, and the first one was that, "Teacher, when you pass away, who is our teacher?" And the answer is that is that discipline. You know, the the precepts, the the sila, that would be your teacher. The second question is that, um, when you pass away, you know, who is our anchor? Right, who is going to be at the anchor of a pursuit, and or the foundation? And then Buddha says, uh, mindfulness would be your anchor or your, or your foundation of pursuit. And then there's that, that other two are not as important here. Very cool. Now, now, the only other thing I wanted to now, say was... <laughs> the reason, let me, let me, let me just say, because sure. this, this goes back to what you just said, and then you can start a new topic. Okay. Uh, and I want you to finish. Sorry about sure. that. So, okay. so, so it's important to distinguish between Dharma as in Buddha's teaching versus sutta, which is a record of uh, the Buddha's teaching, because sutta is just a it's a it's a it's a documentation, okay. Whereas dharma, you know, so if you didn't hear from Buddha himself, then you couldn't say for sure that the sutta is dharma, okay. And even if you heard it directly from uh, Buddha himself, you have to accept the possibility that because your limited understanding. That what you heard is not Dharma. But the important thing is that what Buddha said is Dharma. Okay? And it's important to understand that that uh, methodology is is so what Buddha said is, is is Dharma and the mental phenomenon is Dharma and the truth of the universe is also Dharma. And the reason that the three are called Dharma is because for Buddha is one of the same. Uh -huh. Very cool. See, I, I like. I haven't heard yeah. it laid out. His like mental that. phenomena is the truth. His truth is what he said, and what he said is you know, and go on and on and on. So, so the th all three are dharma, right? They all, all at, at that point yeah. they all interweave. Yes. So yeah. 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 Very now, cool. Okay. So so continue, Josh. You, you oh, have something else. I was just going to go. Unless you forgot about now. No. <laughs> I was just going <laughs> to this on to the next slide too, and uh, wanted okay. to, to to point out when we do experience, you know. Um, the, the senses, obviously, there's the sense organ, so there has to be an organ for us to experience the sense. Then there has to be an object, and then yes, there's the yes. consciousness between. So yes, there's the yes. uh, just the, the eye, the physical eye, the object yes. that's being looked at, and then eye consciousness. Yes. So there's there's yes, those six yes. consciousnesses we've talked about the other yes. ones, but now Denny yes. is going to relate them again to the elements, which I find fascinating. Um, and yes, I'm glad yes. this teaching. So because shared. because because. You know, to understand uh, Master Jiro's teaching is you must understand the four elements, because his 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 mindfulness of the body technique is all about contemplation, and it always starts with contemplating the four elements. Okay, so it's easy to say that the four element is the earth, the water, the wind, and the fire, but you know, you must have a definition of what they are. You know, you can't just say earth means dirt. That's not that's not going to work, right? So, right. so I like this. I like this interpretation, and I'm going to stick yeah. to it. Which is, which is, is that very... earth is yeah, earth is what you can see, what you can smell, what you can taste, and what you can touch. And this is wind like a very... is what you can touch. Yeah. Yeah. This is like a great verification, you know, from, and I was going to ask you too, if you know of any uh, specific four elements practice, because I'm working on some, uh, I've been collecting information for a long time to do a presentation just on the four elements itself. And the way I've usually heard it taught through um, Theravada type things is they just, they focus on like for earth element, it's solidity. Well, actually there's, there's various ones for earth, but it's solidity, like the bones, um, there's other ones too, but I'll skip those. Water is like fluidity, cohesiveness, 
um, and fire is just temperature and uh, wind is movement. Now, I, th there's people that give slight variations on that, but that's ex experienced in the body and the same type of element that's within the body is pretty much more or less the same thing as the, the uh, elements without outside the body too. So yeah. Um, there's, yeah. Do you, yeah. do you so, know of any like specific four element teaching? There's so many different interpretations. Yeah. There's so many. There's so well, many. I mean, for practice, rather than, like a rather specific than, practice. So I well. usually, I usually, you know, I just say, here's my definition. And, you know, and I like it. And so I'll use it. And, but if oh, you have yeah. a different interpretation, that's, I'm okay with that too. And, but I think one, one, one thing worth mentioning is that you don't actually experience, it's very rare that you would experience one of those by itself. It's always a combination. Okay. That's so the just same. Keep that in mind. Yes. Yeah, keep yes. Now, and, now you know, let's go we'll on. Practice, let's, yeah. Well, hang on just real quick. The, the, the practice, you know, practicing, so, and I don't know if Denny's ever done specific four element practices, but that's right. You know, they can't be held in isolation. I think some people do for practice sake, try to, you know, break them down individually, but that's only for an experience, you know, to, to try to experience, but yeah, they can't really be separated from themselves, right? They can't exist in isolation without the others. Correct. Correct. All right. Okay. So, so, so now I want to talk about my understanding of, of what Master Ji had taught us and, and how it is the foundation of our Saturday practice. And that is start with the four elements. Okay. With understanding that there's fire, there's earth, there's water, and there's wind. And then the next thing is to talk about the four postures. And this is one of the things that is very unique about Master Jiro's teaching is that we don't just sit. Okay. In fact, as far as we're concerned, there's the five uh, postures. There's also the exercise. Now, of course, you can argue that exercise is sort of like standing and walking combined. Okay. A little bit of both. Now, I, I added the word komaiti, and i never seen that word in, in English like that. And the reason is that... Um, the Chinese phrase for the four postures doesn't get translated. So there's a there's 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 four, and then there's sort of the uh, 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 posture maybe the uh, symbolism maybe, and then there's a word here that get never get translated. There's a word here that never get translated, and so I just go ahead and translate it as mighty, and 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 so so, but whatever it is, it's important to say that it's not just posture. Is some kind of noble form, and and the reason I believe why we we say that is because human is the only species in the animal kingdom is capable of all four. Okay, so that that to me says that it would be a shame you don't make use of it. Okay, now what's interesting is that masters teaching basically associate these four postures with the four elements. So, for example, he says, standing is one is the posture to accentuate the fire, because fire in this case is say the muscle, is is that if you stand, especially so so he ta always talk about you stand like the pine tree, you know the the the, the foot are firmly on the ground, growing roots, and then the rest of the body has to be flexible. So you know you have to unlock your knee. Let the muscle take over. So as a result, the fire element grows in you. And then sitting is the solidity part, is the, is the earth element where you're supported uh, in the upper body by, your, by, your, by, your, um, uh, by yourself. And then the, the lower body is, is... So we talk about sitting as in sitting like a bell. So your waist down is the pedestal for the bell. Your spine, your body is actually like the, the clapper on, on the bell that is hanged from the ceiling. And so the proper way of sitting is where you use uh, essentially no uh, muscle. You're just basically stack, you know, stacking on top of each other using only your structure. Now, the lying down, and Master talks about that being a water element, because th there's no form, there's no shape. You just lie there. And you're not supporting with with anyone, but yet we say we lie like the like the bow, like bow and arrow. So a bow looks very static, but it's full of energy. And so the idea that that 
just because you're lying down doesn't mean you're dead. You know, you're, doesn't mean you're, you're actually full of energy. It's just that you don't support your body anymore. And in that case, the water is like, is like um, um, uh, a nutrient. It's like uh, replenishing your body. And then finally, walking. Now, remember we said that uh, wind is something that you can feel, but you cannot touch. No, something that you can touch, but you cannot, you cannot, uh, it on, you, you, you only know the presence, but you cannot, you cannot see it, you cannot smell it, you cannot taste it. So wind in this case is, is much more to do with your nerve, your nerve sensing. And the way Master teach walking is all about the touch. It's all about really making it, making yourself very sensitive to, to the bodily uh, uh, contact with your environment. Now, what's interesting is that Master not only associate the posture with the element, but he also use them interchangeably by explaining how each of the element has both a positive and a negative. So, for example, he talks about the earth. You know, earth is dirt, is solidity. So you use that to build your house. But you have too much of it, you would be buried in it. Okay? Now, water is what you use to irrigate your dirt. So you add your vitality to your, your dirt. But you could be drowned in it. Similar with fire, you know, uh, earth needs warm because nothing else grows, uh, you know, uh, unless there's a little bit of warm. But you could, you know, you could be incinerated with, with fire. And similarly with wind, you know, wind adds ventilation to your dirt, but you could be, you know, blown down by the wind. So, so the idea then is that you have to understand the, inter in the interoperability between the postures. So one thing that the master says is that don't just wake up in the morning and sit. Now, this is one thing that he's really against is that you come to the you come to the Dharma hall, you stand. You stand because you're not even wake up yet. So you stand and you let the the fire element rise in you. And he talks about how but when you start to feel sweat, when you when you then you sit. You don't want to overdo it. And then he talks about how, for example, when you're tired, when you're tired, you know, at night. Um, and you still want to meditate. You know, when you're tired at night, you should go to sleep. But if you still want to meditate, then you lie down first, and then you let your body, you know, recover yourself before you sit again. Sitting is always the central posture, and you just like he talks about these these uh, these 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 things that have each other. Similar walking. Sometimes you know you you might have too much energy. You might have too much energy, and you get too nervous, and so walking becomes a very good practice. So, 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 so I like the way he mix and match these different postures and the idea, and it's very rare. I mean, I've been with him for for three years uh, before the pandemic. It's very rare that he would ask his students to sit more than twenty minutes. I mean, he would even go as far as saying that thirty minutes is the limit. Forty minutes—that's crazy. An hour today, you know, that that is ridiculous. <laughs> So two days, yes, but keep keep changing back and forth because he talks about how if you don't have enough fire, that means you don't even have circulation in your body and blood flow and all that, then the best you can do would be lazy zen, you know, sleeping through the whole thing. And if you don't have the concentration and your mind is wandering, then you have what is called the monkey zen. You know, none of that is good for you, right? You need quality, not quantity. Now the next slide is when he brings the concept of the elements and the and the posture into this one thing that he talks about, which is that if there is one method that will lead you to nirvana, it would be the mindfulness of body. And so let's talk about mindfulness. So in this case, there's the four foundations of mindfulness. So, so the 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 word four actually never appear in the sutta. Okay. The sutta is, is Sate Patanya Sutta. Sate is, is mindfulness. And Patanya, and I, you mentioned in one of the emails that you know, sometimes people call foundation and sometimes people call it something else. And that's because Patanya could be also Upatanya. And the, 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 it's a slight different uh, uh, interpretation. One is a foundation and one, the other one is more like the, 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 uh, the attention or something else. But anyway, um, in the sutra, they never really separate into four as if you have to go from one to two to three to four. It's more about the four aspects of, of the mindfulness. And that's the body, the feeling, the mind, and the, and the dharma. Okay. Now, 
this is something that no one talked about like that. And Master would say, well, let's just think about those four in terms of the four postures. And so basically, he basically says that standing is when you can really observe your body. And sitting down is when you can really observe your feeling or your sensation. And then lying down is you can't experience anything else but the effect of your mind. Not the mind, but the effect of the mind. And finally, he thought that Dharma would have to be something to do with walking. Okay? And he even has stories about he actually entered into samadhi while walking. All right. So now, let's move on to the next slide. And... Josh? Well, it's a, it, it might be a good time to comment now if you want to go back to the, the other slide. So, you know, when I first heard uh, these teachings, you know, it just made complete sense to me. It, it, although I'd never heard them anywhere else, you know, the, the, the four main postures, the four major postures and how, how they correlate, you know, fire, um, standing. It's just like, well, that energy will just, just flow up. And I know at late at night, sometimes if I wait too long to meditate, uh, then, you know, um, I will stand up because as far as I know, nobody's ever fell, fallen asleep standing up before, right? You can't, uh, I, I, obviously if you want to continue practice, like Denny said, you lay down and rest first, but it, it's almost impossible to fall asleep uh, when you're standing up because of that, the, the kind of the fire energy. And then, you know, the, the sitting, obviously. Not only that, it, it's a, mm -hmm. it, you need your mind, you need your thinking mind to stand. The body has to, you know, the body has to adjust. It's, it's, a, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's what we call the unstable posture. That's right, because I have actually kind of fell asleep, but I only tilt just a little bit, wake right back up, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So yeah. It's, it's, it's a very good way to actually practice mindfulness because it's, it's half of it is already done for you. That's right, yes. And in the sitting, you know, you just look at like a mountain or a huge stone or something, you know, talk about the earth elements, you know, it's just stable and, you know, you know, sit like the bell. A bell is really stable when it's sitting down, right? Or the, the yes, out part yes. side of it. In yes, water, yes. there's no resistance, right? So it, it, water follows the, the least resistance, right? So you're not fighting, it's just gonna, it's just gonna completely relax and just go wherever, whatever you're laying on, conform to whatever you're laying on for the while. And then wind, you know, the movement, walking, I mean, that's so, so obvious, right? So wind is yes. movement, blowing and yes. movement. And then, but this is when Denny just did this thing with the four right knowings, that's, uh, those are, those are new to me and they make total sense as well. And I'm, I'm glad right. for that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, sometimes master make them up as he goes. Well, well, I mean, that's, that's then, right? I mean, absolutely. No, no, I mean, seriously, yeah. you know, like there yeah. are two kinds of teachers, okay? There are two kinds of teachers. I was a professor for nine years. I can tell you for a fact that, that, that when we teach undergraduates, we teach from the book, okay? And when we teach graduate students, we teach from experience. So there are people who teach based on what they read and how they interpret. And then there are people who teach based on the experience and then they would go and find words and interpret it their own way. That's right. You know? I love, so I love anyway. both modalities. Yeah. It was oh, you a need good both. sign of a good both. teacher yeah. for me. Yeah, exactly. Can do yeah. both. Yeah. What yeah. Denny mentioned, though, the, the, the four foundations of mindfulness, actually, my original point was just a very minor one. For the original topic was that you know it's for years it was it was in translated as the four foundations of mindfulness i know people in theravada now are often translating it as the four establishments of mindfulness now it's a subtle distinction um because it used to be four foundations you would you would get a foundation and then you would use your mindfulness from there but now if you frame it, in, if, we, if it's framed in terms of the establishments of mindfulness, well then it's kind of like you're, you're only mindful of just what you're establishing it, right? So there's no, yes. you know, that's it. Yeah. Um, but I've also heard it as uh, it, It's attending. like the four corner versus the four wall. Mm. You know, uh, the four corners is the foundation, but right. now you have to build the wall and then now, you know, yes. the establishment is kind of like that. You know, how do I know if I'm doing it right? Yeah. Yeah. I also like attending too. the word attending. So you're, this is how you attend with mindfulness. So you establish or have this as a foundation, then you attend in this way with all these, with this way that we're talking about, then you attend correct, to correct. whatever. Correct, well. okay. correct, correct, correct. Very good. Okay. Now, 
I, I, I make a joke about how often uh, Master Jiru will say, you know, from the sutta, you know, this is this. And then I said, I can never find it. You know, I don't know what he's talking about. He must have heard it directly from Buddha himself. But there was one time that he did quote something from the Nirvana Sutta. This is the last documentation of what, what um, uh, Buddha said before he passed into Nirvana. And again, I don't have the English translation, so I have to kind of make it up myself. And it basically says, again, using the Dharma, all methodology, Oh, uh, no, no. Actually, now this this time the word dharma is not is not methodology. This time dharma is all phenomenon. Okay, specifically in this case, it's all uh, mental phenomenon. In other words, all of not just the physical phenomenon, but the mental. Or maybe it's it's a, it encompasses everything. All phenomenon, all phenomenon, and basically it says that all phenomenons are impermanent. Meaning that they, 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 these phenomena comes together when the, when the condition is correct, and then they will disappear when the condition is correct again. Right? Condition has to come together before something happens. Whether it's it's uh, it's it's uh, it's, it's um, so it's just basically that all phenomena are impermanent. All phenomena are phenomena are rising and fading, fading away, and when the rising and fading ceases then you have reached nirvana. So this is actually from, well, supposedly from Buddha's mouth, and it's, it's, it's a very important part of the Nirvana Sutta. It documents what he said you know, in, 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 his, in his final days, and it's basically that, that explains what nirvana is. Nirvana is a sensation of rising and failing. Now, going back to the slide that we had for Einstein, and if you work your way back Okay, because it was from space to time, from time to, to 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 rising and fading. So again, it means that when you when when time and space, when the notion of time and space cease to exist, then you are in nirvana. Okay, and the way to the 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 the, 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 the further explain it is that you have when you have time and space, then there's rising and fading. Now, this is very interesting because now we're going to go back to Master's teaching once again. Now, De Denny, I would just, I would just uh, weigh in real quick. Yeah, there's 32 synonyms for Nibbana. So I've got a post on my site if you're interested on that. You could maybe check that out. Um, one of them, I think, is cessation, right? Or uh, yes. Um, yes. relinquishment, yes. right? And the fourth yes. foundation of mindfulness in Pali is uh, Dhamma, it's plural. And like Denny was saying, sometimes that's interpreted as phenomenon. Some, yeah. uh, and some people interpret it as contents of mind. Uh, the, the, the technical way is it's a, it's a list of other lists, though. So there's a, a yeah. list of other lists is another one. And then, you know, maybe I'll include also in the Pali and Theravada, the, the last words of the Buddha. I think Denny's quote there was really helpful, too. So that's really cool. I'm yeah. not familiar with the Nirvana yeah. Sutta. All right. Yeah. Now, there, there, there's a phrase, there's a, there's a phrase of four verses. That, I mean, there's a four verses that are very, very popular among the Mahayana. I have never seen it in the in the Theravada, and it talks about the uh, the contemplation of the four foundations: the body, the the feeling, the mind, and the Dharma, and and what each one of them uh, represents. And this is very, very common. Uh, everybody says it. Everybody says it as if they understand it. What's interesting is that uh, Master said it completely different. Some of them are the same, but very different. And, and so rather than comparing the, the more common versions versus Master version, because that would take some time and, and it's probably not really what we want to do, I just, I just interpret what he said, okay? Translate what he said. So basically he says, the, 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 this is, the, course, this is the, the beginning, you know, as you begin to contemplate your body, you would realize that the body is not solid or not firm. As you begin to contemplate your feeling, you realize that... Now, th it's important that we understand in this case is the feeling, because we in the past we talked about sensation and perception. So this way, I, I, for a while I was going to use, because it's, the Chinese word can mean both. And so this, I use the word feeling because that's a literal translation, but in reality, it's really more about 
the combination of sensation and perception. In other words, if you if you are able to sense without assigning a value to what you sense, this is what we said: attention without intention. Then there's no there's no there's no suffering. There's no dukkha. Okay, so it's when you feel, meaning that you use both your your sense door and your brain, then you will end up with suffering. Okay, now, this is very important. This is actually very important because when when master and I was there when master I, I pick up master from the airport, and we started talking, and he has this revelation, and the revelation was that he is not going to teach beginners anymore. Okay, he's going to let his student teach beginner because he doesn't have enough time and he's going to concentrate on teaching you know, advanced students. And so from now on, he's going to focus on the contemplation of feeling and, 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 and he's going to teach Yi Jing Jing because Yi Jing Jing is like the, the five breathing exercise to the contemplation of body. Whereas you know, the, the, when you practice the, the, the contemplation of body, you have to practice the breathing exercise. And when you practice the, um, the, the, the contemplation of feeling, you have to practice eating. And he said, he, he actually said, explained it. And he says, the reason is that feeling can be pleasant, unpleasant, or neither pleasant nor pleasant. Those are the three feelings they have to do with your thinking brain. And we don't want that. We want to go beyond that, and we want to go to the kind of feeling that is really. Uh, he used the Chinese word that meant. Um, uh, I, I don't want to use the word relaxate, but but essentially, no thinking kind of feeling, just just sensation without perception. And so so he elaborate on that. But but the point is that um, that if you if if is so in fact he he explained the word sama which is right. You know, what makes something right? What makes mindfulness right? What makes uh, knowing right? Right is when you're not hindered by your, when you're not hindered by your five hindrances. No thinking, no, no, no uh, attachment, no, no, no aversion and so forth. Okay, so that's, that's what he said about the foundation of uh, feeling. Now, what's interesting is that he changed the mind. The mind in the, in the traditional way is about no self, and he changes that. He says, when you contemplate your mind, it's about contemplating the rising and fading. So his, his technique is really actually starting with the contemplation of the four elements to the contemplation of the rising and, and fading. In fact, he talks about not participating in your breath. Let your body breathe on its own and observe your breath as it is just rising and fading. And, and so he talks a great deal about it. Now, the funny things he talks about is, he says, he says but contemplation of Dharma doesn't make sense. He says, I've never ex I'd be able to contemplate Dharma because Dharma is not standalone. Contemplate is embedded in the first three. So I, I, that's why we talk about, you know, Dharma no drama. <laughs> now, What's interesting, go ahead, Josh. Go ahead. Oh, you know, just a few things, and that's the, the feeling thing. In my, if I don't know if you can hear this in the background, my refrigerator is making strange sounds. <laughs> so the feeling, that's right, because uh, it's only when, when we start assigning perceptions to these sensations or the way we're sensing with our sense organs, then that's when the possibility of dukkha at least increases right so if it's just pure yeah. sensing then it, there yeah. and there's no perceptions no labeling of anything then it's just yeah. like it's yeah and then the the yeah. rising and fading we all know that on the the night of the buddha's enlightenment right uh, uh, he was said to start reviewing his past lives and then seeing yeah. uh, the transmigration of other lives coming and going into other lives but then he turned his mind to this rising and fading this impermanent nature and from what I'm gathering from Theravada, that's actually how he uh, started to attain enlightenment, is turning his mind to the, the impermanent nature, the Anicca uh, thing. Yes. And then the Dhammas, you know, that it, it's, it's, I, I've tried that too. There's a whole list, you know, there's the four foundations of mindfulness, five hindrances, uh, five sense bases, uh, the, you know, or, I mean, the six sense bases, you know, the, um, I won't go through them all here, the seven factors of enlightenment. So. Technically, in the sutta, there's all, there's like these five different lists that that are technically, and you know, to try to contemplate. Well, I don't know. I'll just stop there. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. We we talk about that the forty, 
ways of contemplating, yeah, all that. Okay, now, now this is very interesting. I actually, uh, I remember uh, he talked, he, he said that in one of the lectures, and then out right after uh, I, uh, I, I, we got on the plane, and I made a mistake of actually getting a sign seat next to his. That's never been pleasant. And so after that, after that one experience, I just I I, I I I escaped to the back of the cabin and I stay away from him for as long as I can until we have we have we get off the plane again. So I sat next to him, and you know he he is you know like when he flies, you know his students would buy him uh, not a first class ticket, but sometimes a business class and sometimes a a a, a premier you know coach and like that and so if i follow him i would be sitting next to him but he 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 completely wastes those things because he doesn't drink he doesn't eat meat he doesn't even use the leg room because he he just he just meditate he puts his legs up and meditate so I, i'm sitting next to him and and i said uh, master you just mentioned these four things and and then I just, like, the next few slides is what I said. I said, doesn't that lead to this and lead to that and lead to that? And he looks at me, and he turned back, and he went back to his meditation. And I sat through that whole journey like a fool, you know, thinking, like, what did I say? That? What did I do, you know? What did I do? I thought I was being so smart. <laughs> so, so, like, half an hour later, he turns to me and says, so do I need to add anything more? <laughs> it basically said, yeah, what you said is right. That's exactly what I meant. Okay, so what did he say? What did I say? So I said, um, here's the three Dharma seals, or four Dharma seals, or the four marks of existence. They're very similar. First of all, um, if you want to call this the four Dharma seals, then it's impermanence, Nirvana, uh, the impermanence, um, uh, dukkha, nirvana, uh, nirvana, and non-self. Okay, those are the they call the, the the dharma seal, meaning that that if you reach nirvana, those are the four things that you would experience. Those are the dharma. Those are the truth of the our existence that you would experience. Now it turns out that the four can be reduced into one because uh, dukkha, uh, suffering, and impermanence is one of the same. Right? We suffer because we think that something should be impermanent is actually permanent, meaning that if we don't like something, we don't want it, we don't want it to go away. And if we like something, we don't want it to go away. So that's the difference between attachment and aversion. And, but on the other hand, if it's impermanent, it will go away on its own. And whether it's, it's something you like or you don't like. So, so, so the three seals, the three Dharma seals, is just that it's impermanent, it's nirvana, it's non-self. That's what it says. Okay, now, what does that mean? Oh, back off. It means that that what the way that Master teaches the four foundation mindfulness, the body, contemplation of the body would allow you to experience impermanence and dukkha. Okay? And by the contemplation of the mind, experiencing the rising and fading, ultimately will lead you to nirvana. And finally, the idea that when you get to the end, dharma is no drama, that their dharma is not standalone, then that means that you experience that emptiness and non-self. Okay? Now, what's interesting is that correspond to the seal is what's called the gate of liberation. Now, the gate of liberation is not three consecutive gates, and the Master actually explains that. It's not three consecutive gates. It's actually three gates that you can choose one. And when you pass the gate, you liberate it. You don't need to come back and do it a second time. That would be crazy. Okay? So the three gates that you can choose, one is called the desire, desireness gate, one is called the sinus gate, and one is called the emptiness gate. So... Essentially, by focusing, by having everything else culminates into this idea of having your practice reduced to one of contemplating rising and fading, would open up this thing called the sinus gate, the one that has no, where the notion of time and space no longer exists. That's it. That's what I asked him if that is true on the plane and he ignored me for half an hour. Before he returns, he says, do I need to add anything anymore? 
<laughs> so what did I learn? What did I learn from all this over the three years and the five, six years that I, I've been practicing on my own and with Master? I think these are the things that I want to summarize in what I have learned and what I, what I have yet to learn. Denny, is, could, is, is it possible, yes. oh, sorry, to, before you jump into the slide to comment very briefly on this, um, these, these, uh, these li liberation gates are really profound, you know. Um, the way I understand them are, uh, with it, in, it's also known as the three characteristics of existence, right, um, the, the seals. Um, that's the flip side of it. That's the right. The seals are called, they're not exactly the same. They're not that's right. It's, it's because like, the, the, the seal is when you reach liberation. The characteristic is before you reach liberation. I see. It's, okay. Similar, but not the same. Yeah. Gotcha. Now the 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 death or the desireless gate. So impermanence. One of the best ways I've heard of impermanence. It's kind of inconstancy too. So no matter how we try to we we try to arrange external conditions in our lives to get things the way we want, but we realize that we can't maintain those external conditions the way we want in the long run. So it's not yeah. a success for happiness I in think the long th run. That's correct. So, so, what so this, yeah. Mm -hmm. so this, this is almost like uh, desireness is almost like non-attachment. That's right. So what I'm getting yeah. at here is yeah. when you realize that we, no matter what we do on the external to try to maintain things to our liking, eventually we can't keep that up. It's not so. Then we, be, when we see that, there's less and less desire for things. Oh, I want to go do this, yeah. and I it's, have to have things this way. That's yeah. right. That's what we call so fool's errand. Yeah. That, that there's no way to keep going like that. Then we we just yes. start desiring less and less because what's the point of spending so much time and energy doing all that, right? And then right, the the right. signless the signless gate. You know, I'm going to pass on that too because that's the one that I have a, that word signless. I don't completely fully understand that. It's, but the it's really bad gate, translation. Yeah, it's bad. Well, no, they, that's it's off. Yeah, but but that's used yeah. a lot. Signless. That's used a lot. Yeah. And then the emptiness is just. You know, there is no, uh, if you look at everything, there, especially since everything's impermanent, always changing, non-maintainable in the long run, there's no essence. So because of that, you can't boil anything down to its essence. So everything is basically empty of an essence. So that's what I, I always ask, well, what's it empty of? And that's one of the, uh, the, the translations. So, all right, yeah, Denny, let's, um, uh, yeah. Yeah, if I may, I, I know you're, you're, yeah. you're running up a clock, running up to oh. your, your, your stuff or maybe even beyond. So, yeah. so the three. So, so think of this this way. This is how I understand it. That um, if you talk about nirvana as just necessary Buddhahood, but at least you know outside of the three realms, and you have escapes in Sara. So, what are the three ways to do that? Most common way, and the most common way one is the Theravada practice, where you try to achieve arahantship. Okay, that's crossing the emptiness gate. Okay. Now I, I forgot the word, but you know that there's there's another way of becoming Buddha. What is that called when you just like basically observing the twelve links of interdependence, understanding the how the nature behaves itself. Do you know what I'm talking about? I'm not sure. No. Well, you know the the one where he says that that is someone that he doesn't even know the existence of Buddha and Buddha's teaching, but somehow he figured out on his own. Oh yeah. And become enlightened. Well, yeah. yeah, there's uh, well the private Buddhas too. It's not that one though. Yeah, right? that's that's it is that one. Yeah, yeah. They can't they, they understand, but they can't teach other people, right? Or, or that they they experience on their own they, without really oh, yeah, relying yeah, on yeah. Any, any previous people's teaching. So they just basically observe yeah. the, yeah. the 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 nature, and he's he's essentially observing the impermanence of nature, and become. Uh, liberated, become uh, emancipated. That's the desire. It starts with the P Buddha. Uh, prop, uh, yeah, I think it means yeah. private Buddha. Yeah, but I'm not yeah. sure. So, so that that's the desire gate. That, that that person crosses that gate. Now, so the question is, what is a sinus gate? Well, you know, a lot of people they they chant Amita Buddha. Okay, so but most of the people who chant Amita Buddha don't know what Amita Buddha stands for. Amita is both Amitabha and Amitayu. Those are the two, they actually have two names. A means none, zero, opposite, right? Amita is, is, uh, is, is basically um, uh, 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 beyond time. Amitayu is beyond space. So the Amita Buddha is actually a select Buddha 
who is beyond both time and space. So that's that that is the Amit Buddha. That, that so if you chant Amit Amita Buddha, then and you're successful, then you enter the non sign gate. Okay. That, that's All beautiful, right. so, Denny. I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to leave, and I'm gonna let Denny wrap this up. I apologize for. Um, okay. Thank for, you, for Josh. This, but it's okay. I'll, I'll see you I, soon. Yeah. Yeah, it will be in I'll touch soon. So, so, so make sure you watch this because there's, um, there's more to come. You know, there's, there's that's right. a sequel. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thank you so Bye much. Now. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you. All right. So he left me on my own. Man, that's dangerous. So this is the last slide anyway. So, so these are the things that I have learned that I think is worthy of, 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 of summarizing. And it also represents what I try to do during our Saturday practice is that, um, um, we we don't exp we don't there's there's no mind we just all we're doing is experiencing the effect of a mind okay so that's one the second one is that the reason why we practice chi and again this is this is this is unique the chi the the understanding of chi is unique to the Taoists and the Taoists represents thousands of years of Chinese culture and when the Taoists uh, really experience chi, they experience it through meditation. So that that makes the Taoist is sort of a subset of the yogic practice. And yoga, the word yoga, yoj, Y-U-J, means the union. It's, it's actually the harness between the oxen. It's the word for the yoke. It's the, it's the word for the, the harness between before the oxen as they pull the, the cart so that you synchronize them. So the idea of the word yoga or yoj is that you want to achieve synchronicity or union, unity between your mind and your body. And the harness in this case, our interpretation of the harness is the chi. So we talk about the physical body, the chi body, and then the mind body. So we practice chi not only for physical health, but also as a way of bringing our mind and our body together. And then the next thing is that, is that uh, people talk about emotional intelligence. As, as in saying that we want to be a little bit more intelligent about our emotion, which obviously is 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 important, but people often forget uh, the other definition for the word intelligence, as in central intelligence agency. You need some way in your practice. It's not theory. It's very practical. You need some way of understanding your emotional state. And in in my practice, in our practice. As we as we develop our breath and our uh, develop uh, mindfulness of our breath and mindfulness of our body, they become very sensitive. They actually become very sensitive. They are like the the canary in the cave mind. That as soon as your your mind wants to uh, wants to degenerate into the hindrances, the first thing that your body would react and your breath would react. So they become the intelligence into your emotion. So that's important to me. That's what I learned. Now, in the Buddhist teaching, they talk about the 84,000 called Dharma Khanja, which translate into Chinese as the gates to Dharma. So the idea is that Buddha himself have 84, in possession, is in possession of 84,000 methodology in achieving um, liberation. Now, now, why is it 84,000? Actually, it's 84,000 because he, he was a teacher for about 45 years, right? He uh, renunciated when he was um, 39, and it took him six years to uh, become uh, uh, enlightened, and then, oh, uh, I'm sorry, 29, and then it took him six years to become, so he, he was enlightened when he was 35, and then he uh, uh, achieved Arunavana when he was 80. So he spent 45 years as a teacher, and so if you take 45 years, 365 days a, a, a year and multiply that and then multiply five, which is, which is um, the number of times that he, he was able to teach because in the old tradition, it's not 24 hours, it's not even 12, it's, it's six different time periods within a day, one of which is used for sleeping. And so he was able to at best teach five times. So if you take 45, 365 and 5, that's 84,000. So the fact that he had 84,000 methods just meant that he had 84 different opportunities 
to teach his his uh, his 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 technique to f different audience, and each time he tune it a little bit differently depending on the audience. So out of the eighty four thousand, rising and fading is my key. Okay, so that's why I focus on rising and fading. Rising and fading initially as rising and fading uh, in terms of a bodily function like a breath and then ultimately rising and fading in terms of a mental phenomena one at a time. Okay, so of course I'm long, long way from that. and But that's, that's in summary, in a nutshell, the meaning behind the Saturday practice. Okay, so with that... Uh, Thanks, 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 thank, a big thanks to Josh for um, tolerating me for so long and a big thanks for all of you who are watching live and, and all of those who will be watching uh, recorded. With that, I bid you goodbye and I wish you joy, peace and health. <laughs>